Hello and uh, welcome to our webinar on SEO on-site Redux. I'm Chad Hill and I have Adam Stetzer here with me as well. Yeah, good afternoon, Chad. It's great to be here with everybody and I guess I'm dumber than I, I thought. Chad, what does uh, on-site Redux really mean? <laughs> great question. I thought you might ask, Adam. So I, I pulled up from Wikipedia um, the, the definition of Redux and there were some really interesting things here that you might want to do one weekend, like watch part two of the X-Files, uh, buy the Adam Ant um, album, uh, <laughs> nice, maybe nice. play some paintball, etc. So anyway, but we're talking about on-site because um, you know we spent a lot of time talking about link building and building your domain authority, but there we by no means want to um, leave out on-site as a critical part of on-site of, of SEO. And so let's talk about that and put it into perspective because uh, as we've said many times. Uh, on-site SEO is probably 70% of what ultimately drives your ranking in the search. In, I'm sorry, that's off-site SEO, link building, is 70% of what drives your rankings. But the other 30% comes from on-site SEO, what you're doing on your website. And this is, uh, as we've said many times again, that you know on-site SEO is necessary but not sufficient. It's very, very difficult but not impossible to get a website to rank um, by uh, by um, Without doing some with with just link building and you know onsite SEO though of course is what really um, helps uh, bring their rankings up faster. I wanted to spend a minute here and just talk about some of the tactics and you know when you're faced with a website uh, how to maybe think about onsite SEO and so uh, I we often get websites that come in and they're brand new and that's actually the bulk of the websites we're working with that have a very low domain authority and so the the recipe that we recommend there is that you know, we do an on-site audit, and we can help you with the implementation. But a lot of times, you know, we hand off that on-site report to you, and then you go make the changes yourself. And then most of our energy is really focused on building domain authority through primarily content marketing. So, what can we do to create interesting, compelling content that can be placed, uh, syndicated out to other websites where people find it, and then also there are there's links back to your website and that in, it ultimately drives, improves your domain authority and, and improves your rankings. So um, as part of that, we always recommend that someone, there is some sort of ongoing on-site update process. So what we typically recommend is that someone write a blog post, ideally a couple times a month, but certainly at least once a month, just to get some fresh content on that website. Because as you're building links to the website and the domain authority is going up, you want that on-site content there too. because that's just another signal that, hey, this is a lived-in website, there's new stuff going on here, and we deserve the chance to show up in the rankings for the keywords that might be in that content or on the, across the website. So you know, that's, that's typically the recipe we talk about 70% you know, of the time with the clients that, that we're uh, working with. There are some cases where you, know, you have a client who has a very um, high domain authority website. The tactics don't really change. You, know, you might not be as focused on building, um, if, if someone comes in with a very high domain authority website, there might be some special opportunities that where you can expand content more rapidly. Usually someone with a high domain web authority website tends to have a larger budget. And so we have some ideas that kind of fit both of the buckets that we want to talk about today. Okay, so some of the obstacles before we get into how to do on-site optimization, some of the obstacles that, that we've run into over the past, uh, coming up on five years here, is that a lot of times people say a client says they're going to create content, but they don't. Other times, um, the client just doesn't even know what to write about. And um, the other thing that happens is that sometimes we write the content or you write the content for your client, but they never approve it and never, or it doesn't ever go up on the website. So you're doing the work, but it's never really getting on the website. Another one that happens often is that there's problems with access to the website. Uh, and finally, we've had this happen where there's another company that's involved and they're just not being very cooperative because they don't like the fact that either you or us are, are working on uh, SEO with the client. And so they're, they're putting up obstacles. So what we've tried to do is you know, take all this into account with our experience and come up with some tactics and an approach that we that we find is we believe is very relevant uh, with with the best way to create content that's compelling to an audience that comes to your website, but also 
positions your, your website in the best way so that it also will get rankings in the search engines. Yeah, how many times have we heard that chat? Oh, I'm going to make tons of content, and they just don't. Or the other one you didn't list there is they say they write one blog post, maybe two, and then it just drops off, and uh, there's no content updates for six months. So I'm always interested in where that mental block really lives, if it's uh, time management or more just fear. I have the time. I'm sitting here staring at the screen, and I just can't get the fingers to move, can't start typing. It's uh, interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. So what we want to talk about today is our process that, that we believe works really well for expanding the content on a website and you know, really putting in, into a process around how to do it so that, it's, as Adam said, you're not, when you look at the screen, you're not sort of lost in terms of what to go do. So there's four steps that we wanted to boil it down to. The first one is identifying demand. Where, what kind of content are people looking for out there? Because if you don't know what that is, if you don't know what to write about, which is one of the obstacles, it's very hard to get started. The second one is knowing how to create great content. So there's a lot of different ways that you can create content. There's written content, there's video content, there's infographics, and we'll talk about some of those. The third one is that when you actually do create that content, you want to tune it so that it has the best chance of both having an impact on the audience that sees it, as well as, again, sort of that secondary audience, the search engines, who are going to find it, index it, and hopefully put it into their results. And then the final one is tracking and promoting so that, again, you know, was I successful with the content that I created? And then also get promoting it so that you have uh, yet another way of driving audience to that content so that uh, people see it and engage in it. So I wanted to also notice, you know, what, what's missing here. We're not talking today about W3C validation, image alt tags, keyword tags, you know, reworking the URL structure of your website, and all the other what we would call SEO, on-site SEO window dressing. We're talking about creating content because that's the stuff that really we believe has the biggest impact on getting incremental new rankings in the search engines and also engaging your customer on your website. They're never going to see an image alt tag or know that you're, I mean, even though there are some old badges that say your website's W3C validated, no one really cares. So this stuff, there are, you know, again, 92% or 95% of the websites that we get have no problem with the search engine crawling it. Three or four years ago, people were still, you know, in, in sort of version one or two of their website, and there were a lot of issues where people were blocking search engines from crawling their website. You just don't see that nearly as much as we did a couple years ago. So a lot of this stuff just isn't important anymore. Okay, so on to identifying demand. The the best thing that we would say is that you should write content or create content about things that people are looking for. Now, there's probably somebody out there that would say, well, that's putting the cart before the horse, but we're all pragmatic marketers here, and we believe that we'd rather talk to an audience than try to and sort of capture demand out there for our products or services than go try to create some new category and, and, and create something that's never existed, and as a consequence, no one's looking for it. So we're talking today about marketers looking to tap into existing demand, existing um, audience out there of, of people looking for certain things. The first place that is a great way to start, uh, especially when you're, you're looking for those topics to talk about, is competitor research. And we're going to take a look at that in just a second. Uh, the other one is that if you don't know competitors or even look at, which is pretty rare, you can always look at um, our research tab to come up with some ideas. Uh, you can also use Google AdWords Keyword Tool. Those are it's another way to, to basically get some ideas on keywords. You want to always look at the difficulty of the keyword. So you know sometimes, and, and again, this differs a little bit maybe from the, the head target keywords you may be using in your primary SEO campaign. We're sort of assuming with this webinar that you already have, have done at least the minimum of making sure that if you had four or five target keywords, that there are pages on your website that have those keywords. And so it always makes sense to continue to build the content on that. But what we're saying here is that what can we do to go after some other keywords um, that maybe aren't quite as competitive 
But if you add them up, so if you find, again, if you instead of a keyword that has 1,000 searches a month, if we could go find you know, 10 that have 100, well, that adds up to 1,000. So what are some things we can do to you know, go after that long tail? Uh, and that's, that's the idea here. Uh, when you're looking at those keywords, you really need to make sure that that keyword is relevant or, the, or that what people are searching for when they use that keyword is something that you offer. No one really wants to, I mean, again, you don't really want to go out and create content trying to trick someone into thinking that they're looking for, product, for this type of service, and because there's good volume and low competition, I can read a piece, write a piece of content about that, but it's not really ever going to convert to a user. So always make sure that you do the reality check on, is it relevant, and do I have something to offer these people? And then again, this is really a dynamic process. So you may want to do come back to this process that we're going to look at in a second and do it every quarter or even every month or every week. Uh, to really start to develop a set of keywords that you can feed into the next step, which was which will be creating great content. So let's take a look at an example real quick here. Yeah, I, yeah. Jim, I just wanted to say before you move on, I think it's not only a dynamic process, but it's also kind of a subtle process. I mean, what you're saying here about identifying the demand is not to drastically alter what it is you have to say, because what you have to say and the content you need to create is what's in you and that's going to be valuable. But there are very subtle changes here you can do that will be the difference between ranking in front of a lot of people who are looking for that topic but maybe are expressing it differently. An example is maybe you want to build a page about you know, a website development program and so you structure all your content around that. But if you didn't look at the demand and ask Google and use these keyword tools, you might not know that actually people search for a website design program. Are those conceptually different? No, they're practically synonyms. But what Google chooses to rank on one term is very different than on the other. And with a few tweaks and directions of your content creation, understanding where that demand is will make a huge difference. It's sort of like shooting at the wrong target or not knowing the target you shoot at when you shoot your arrow. So I think Jeff's point is this is not only a dynamic process, but a subtle one. And you need to know right up front where that demand is because that's your goal. Great point. So let's take a look at an example, and, and I'm using the Vet Hubs example that we've we looked at many times. And uh, again, I went to our research tab. I plugged in. Well, what I what I did is I actually went to one of my, the head terms, uh, veterinary websites or vet websites, and I looked at the top three or four competitors. And Vet Hubs ranks on page one for vet websites, but I I grabbed the the three other top competitors here. So actually, this columns are the columns that you see here are the first column is Bed Hubs, and then columns uh, two, three, and four here are three of the competitors. And I plugged them all into our research tab, our web grader, and came back with this list of of essentially the the union of all of those four websites rankings. And instead of going sorting by uh, ascending, well, I did actually sort by ascending order and looked at the keywords with the highest rank, the highest monthly search volume at the top, but instead of sort of focusing there, I scrolled down the page, right? So I'm now down here um, in the 50s range. So I'm looking at keywords that have roughly 40 to 50 searches a month. So they're not, these aren't, you know, big keywords that you're going to build a business on. But like I said, if you pick five or six or ten of these, they could add up to some real volume. And because these are lower, because the, the volume is lower on these, the competition is also lower. So I went and I looked, and again, column one is, is uh, vet hubs. And so there's very little exposure other than veterinary websites on these terms. And I went through and I said, well, gosh, veterinary, we veterinary newsletter, we, we kind of could help with that. Veterinary business cards, you know, maybe, that's, maybe that one's a, a little bit of a stretch, but, but maybe. Uh, veterinary marketing ideas, definitely. And veterinary sites, also, definitely, we could help with that. So you know, just by scanning down this list, now of course there's other ones here, vet malpractice, not really that good, and there's veterinary clinics in San Diego, not really where we're operating, but those are four good terms that we could pull out of this list and say, let's go plug this into an on-site content expansion program, and, and then think about what can we create to put content on our website about this. Now, this is especially relevant if the domain authority of the client's website is high enough that in some cases, just by putting this content up, you will probably be able to rank on this very quickly. Not in all cases, but in some cases, that, that might be all, you, all it needs is just simply getting the content out there, as Adam said, restated a different way, and you might actually start picking up some, um, some rankings on this. 
So let's then talk about how to create the content. Well, there's a lot of different ways to go about this, and you know, just a couple examples that we wanted to put up. Uh, there's, of course, video, and uh, for those of you who follow our blog, we've been Adam and I have been ex ex uh, working with with video quite a bit recently um, because it allows us to pretty quickly identify some keywords and get some content up about those those subject matters. We're able to transcribe the video and get you know, several hundred words of content that where we can, with, with some relatively uh, decent density on that keyword, up in a matter of you know, maybe an hour or so of effort once you factor in prep time, record time, production time, and all the other factors that go in. So you know, that's one example. Um, another, you might, there, there are several people that, that might have something funny they could put up, whether it's a video again that's something funny, or if it's uh, uh, um, a blog post that's funny, that written content, or even some type of graphic. Controversy is a great one. So, you know, as Adam said, maybe you can sort of look at some of these keywords and take a different approach. So if everyone is writing about uh, a topic one way, you could sort of write your piece of content the other way and see if you could, you know, get some click through, or get that piece of content up and get some people reading your content on your website. And then there's some other traditional ones like downloadable assets, white papers, ebooks. These are all ways you can create content. And again, there are also choices on whether you choose to do it yourself or outsource it. So, you know, you as the reseller or par our partner could be the coach to your end client, the one who says, hey, make sure you write the blog post, record the video. You could be the one doing it for them, or you could be outsourcing that to us, or for that matter, someone else. But the real point and what we really care about is just getting the content up and actually taking the action because this will help improve the rankings and also will give the client's website more, more keywords to rank on. Right, and you've read this a million times. There has to be something there of value. So, you know, video, humor, controversy, information, how-tos are great. That's really an information exchange. I think you need to think in terms of if I came to this website, would I want to stay on this page? So you identify your, your demand earlier and what Chad was reviewing with you. Now you've got that person funneling to this page. You need to put something in front of them that's going to meet that demand and be fulfilling in some way, basically be something of value that justifies why they want to spend a few minutes on your page. And that's not as hard as it sounds if you follow these tactics and just start creating it. You'll get better over time, of course. Once you have the great content before you post it on the website, you need to tune it up. And this is, uh, I really like this idea because it really is about tuning. It's not about, it's not about over optimizing or keyword stuffing or some of the stuff that people tried to do a couple years ago and maybe still too for that matter this is really about tuning up the content so that it has the best chances of both having engaging the audience the in customer but also can index well and ultimately show up in the search results because again you get that second flow of traffic off of the off of the search engines and that's really important so let's talk about some of the things that you might want to do uh, to tune up your content so uh, first of all, you want to make sure your content's well written, uh, using interesting layouts, uh, things like images and section paragraph breaks, bullets, and of course, being concise is important. No one wants to read a you know an eight-page blog post. No one has time. Uh, the other thing you want to pay attention to, though, is you do want to look at density, and so you don't want you know you want to make sure that your main keyword focus is repeated in that piece of content that you create, especially if it includes written words, but not to the point where it's a distraction. So it needs to be something that's useful without being a distraction. Uh, also um, looking at internal links, so one of the things that uh, in co-citation, these are great ways when you're putting that piece of content up, it's a great way of saying, well, you know, I have, I've mentioned this keyword in some other places on my website, now I've just taken this time to create this new piece of content on that topic. I should go create a reference link from those other places um, back to it, or vice versa. So you know, depending on kind of how you want to how you structure your site, you might want to actually link from that piece of content to other places on the website as well. So there's you know two ways to go there. And then um, of course you know meta tags still do matter. You know, the right ones do. The ones we really think you should focus on are mostly description. Title is uh, you know also important to show. It's, uh, you want to make sure that that's set correctly. It has your keyword in it. And then some new things that Google's 
really been rewarding in the search engines are things like making sure that you're linked to your Google Plus profile so that you have authorship when someone searches in the search results. That's when you see a little picture next to a blog post or a page of content. That's important. The other one is using schema.org for different types of content on your on your piece of content. So if it so if it has a video, use the schema.org markup for video, or for that matter, you can use uh, video sitemap, but we think schema.org is easier to use, and so you want to make sure that's there. And what you get from that, in many cases, is Google will put a thumbnail of your video that's on the page on your website next to your results. So that's a really important thing to do. Tuning it up is important. Now let's take a look at you know which two pieces of content you would read, and I don't, I, I, I pulled, these are from two sites, one ours, one of our clients. The one on the left, this is some very dense stuff about um, VA, uh, Veterans Administration. No pictures, even though I've suggested to this client, like, hey, you should spend a minute or two and get a picture into that um, post other than the actual author here. But that looks pretty, pretty text heavy. Um, and compared to, I just pulled up one on the right here where I had a couple pictures that I put in. I did some nice drop shadows on the pictures. It didn't take me that long to do it, but it just gives it a much more polished look and lots of paragraph breaks. And you can see here at the bottom, I had some section breaks. There were a few more of those below, but that's just going to make the content much more readable than when you just go super dense like it is on the left. Great. So next is you've got You've come up with the idea, you've created the content, and you've tuned it up. Now it's on your website, or it's on wherever you've syndicated the content, and you need to track and measure its success. So the first thing is to track rankings and analytics. You want to make sure that um, you want to check the page ranking of that. So if you were targeting a certain keyword, you want to publish that content and start tracking that. And you can use our SERP tracker to do that and keep a watch out to see if that ranking pops up on that particular term. If for whatever reason you're not getting the results that you expected, so maybe you picked a, a keyword that's a little too competitive or um, a number of other things, try focusing on less competitive keywords in your on-site content. Go back and make sure that you did have the right title and got the keyword into the description tag. Uh, you know, Go back and work on the content a little bit. So if you didn't have a video or you didn't have authorship set up, that those could be factors that you, I mean, that, that may be impacting more of a click-through rate than an actual ranking. So if you saw that you had the ranking but you weren't getting the click-through, then things like making sure that you were taking advantage of all the opportunities Google gave you for authorship and schema.org markup for video um, uh, markup, those are things that might help there. And then there you know, might be some other things where you might want to increase co-citation because that's another factor that that uh, when you're publishing the content that you might want to look at to make sure that it's well linked on your website or to other websites. And then yeah, finally, I, think, I think these are great points. And I think um, the one thing I would also mention here is start with something less competitive. I, I think that's a really good way to ease into this on-site SEO ranking procedure. Start with something fairly long tail, even that you're not even particularly uh, that focused on just as an experiment, and watch what it does. If it zooms up in Google and jumps right to the top of the first page, first of all, that generates a little bit of excitement. And you can see this process from soup to nuts, which is really good to have faith, oh, wow, this stuff really works great. And I can see uh, the fruits of my labor. Because when you go after more competitive keywords, that can take a very long time. So you start with a very long tail word. Now, if you do that and it doesn't work and you're not coming up, then you, you probably need to dig in a little bit further before you go off and create a lot more content trying to figure out what's wrong. And I, we've seen all sorts of wacky things happen. Uh, when, when people have tried and there is something wrong with their site or they're just not quite doing the procedure correctly. For example, you know, maybe um, a tagged page pops up in the ranking but not the page that they actually intended with the content. So they're hitting, a, they're getting a ranking on a keyword that they have targeted but it's not the page they wanted to have come up with the ranking. Why is that happening? And you want to dig into that. Well, maybe the length of your content is too short and it really hasn't caught Google's attention. You'd want to start digging into things like, is that subpage actually even indexed yet? Maybe you haven't waited long enough. Maybe it's only been a week. I mean, I've had content that's taken, it can take months for Google to find it. Other stuff is found in, in an hour. It's, it's very strange how the spiders work and what they choose to crawl. So I think these are great steps, but start with baby steps. 
see success, and then start graduating up, up, up to the bigger, more competitive keywords. Adam, do you think there's any, uh, on that topic, do you think there's any sort of magic number on how much domain authority your website needs before you can start looking at this? I mean, is there, or do you think it can work on any website given the right set of keywords um, for, for, the, for the website? I, I do not think there's a magic number because I've taken, you know, sites we're working on that are virgin and it made them rank on long tail keywords very, very quickly. And I've had domains with a lot of authority that take a long time on very competitive keywords. So it's a very dynamic process. I think really though, this can be done on any site as long as you don't aim too high, too fast, mainly because you'll get frustrated. And that's why I recommend to experiment with this in really low competitive spaces so you can see how your site interacts with Google. And in many cases, you'll be surprised at just how fast and efficient Google is. I mean, they're just amazing at finding content and categorizing it correctly. Get familiar with that on an intimate level, and it'll really suit you well as you go to generate lots more content. And that's exactly what you want to do. You'll see this happen and go, wow, okay, i got to repeat that 50 times. This is, this is great stuff. Right, in the context of the 70-30 of you know, what, how much effort you need to work on to, to be linking and, and building up some domain authority, how do you, how do you sort of uh, think about these two different these two ideas of the on-site and then obviously link building and content marketing to improve the domain authority and uh, rankings of the, of the website? Well, that's a difficult question. I think it comes down to your first step of where is the demand and how narrowly focused that demand is for what you have to offer. Because there are certain businesses and spaces where there's just lots of long-term keywords that can really give you lots of opportunities. So you could spend a lot of time on on-site going after those with a, what I like to call an SEO landing page, which is just high quality content around that keyword for each one. There are other spaces where there really aren't that many variations in certain professions and just the way people search for certain services where there's really only going to be four or five. So after you've got those landing pages and great content, you may not have a lot more targets. So you may be forced into off-site buzz creation, link building, syndication, social media faster. So that's a really hard one to say for a one-size-fits-all. Great. Well, let's finish it up then with uh, what to do once you put that content on your website and how you're going to actually promote it. And there are just so many ideas and interesting angles on this now, even more so than you know a year ago, about uh, what you can be doing uh, to promote the content. So it goes without saying, of course, at the top here would be social media. Make sure that when you post new content on your website, or for that matter, anywhere else in the web, if you guest blog post, whatever it might be, you want to let people know that that content's out there. Um, we found that uh, you know email marketing is also a great way just to let people know that there's fresh new content up on your website. So if you had an email list and you post a new blog post, you know shooting out that email saying that there's a, a new blog post up is a great way to prime the pump to get some people to that content and get some interaction. Uh, there, of course, you know in that. If you, the way it's written, you know, invite interaction in your piece and on your blog, right? So, you know, if you do um, put up some new content, ask a question to try to get some response and some people commenting on your website, um, especially if it's a blog post on your website, or for that matter, um, if you're if you're using it, if if it's a guest blog post, same idea. We're using we've been kind of playing with this idea of like the of the swarm idea, uh, where you know when you put content out there. You want to. You really want to bring a set of assets to it. So if if you get one of your clients, uh, if they write some an interesting blog post and put it on the website, we think it's a great idea to actually get the employees of the company or people, friends and family of the company, to go and actually have a little conversation on the blog. It gets people. It draws people in to the conversation when they see other people are talking and making interesting points. So starting to think about ways that you can kind of you know bring your own crowd to the content that you're creating, whether it's on your website or, again, it's a, it's, it's a guest blog post somewhere else, is really smart because what, again, we've been seeing is that it actually creates almost a set of credentials when you go to someone to say, I'd like to do a guest blog post or I'd like to, um, uh, you know, I'm going to write content on my website. To be able to bring your audience with them really makes a lot of sense. The, the final thing, um, or a couple more things here, uh, of course, thinking about linking to that content that you've created is also really important. So there's a number of different options you have there. We have several several clients where they may be running a content marketing uh, sort of link program where we're, we're building 
um, earning links to the website, you know, for, for sort of general head terms, but they also have more targeted campaigns running where it's specifically set up to benefit that one page, that one piece of new content. So that's a great way of, of, uh, of again, promoting and of the content you're creating. Uh, syndicating is also good, whether, again, that's uh, syndicating out to other websites out there across the web that might republish the content or give you an opportunity to put the content there in the first place. That's good. And then I already mentioned guest blogging, but when you do guest blog posts, uh, you want to make sure that you check back because if you're able to get some interaction on your blog post, you want to engage in that conversation and, again, try to continue to get more interaction and engagement with your blog post. Again, that's going to be a, a signal for the, get, the place where you're guest blog posting that, hey, this person is really committed to what they're doing. And then again, it's good because it's adding more content, more updates that search engines are going to find and are going to, you know, uh, uh, that will improve, potentially improve um, what's on the, the amount of content on the page. Yeah, these activities really are quite fun, and I think we have a fantastic footprint. So this is really when the part of the process gets exciting because, you know, think back through chat steps. You, you found the demand. You're getting in front of it with high-quality content, and you've created it. You've created it. You've tuned it up really well, so it's, it's ready to be indexed and, and go viral, and then you're out there applying all these resources toward it. And, and the more sophisticated your marketing program can be, they can have all these facets. They really do cross-pollinate. Now, one caution, it can be a little confusing. Uh, we go through this ourselves with so many opportunities to try to promote with all these different activities. It can be a little bit of an organizational challenge. But think that through, and you'll find if you do it three, four, five times, you start to develop a pattern of just how you're going to do it. How am I going to get my social media, do an email blast, get my friends and family to swarm this, build some links to it, get it syndicated, get some graphics, do a guest blog post. You do start to get into a routine, but you'll just see the return on investment shoots up so much higher because the footprint this leaves is just fantastic. Uh, and again, if you don't think Google's picking up on, on all the behavioral footprints these leave, you know, think again, they're, they're very good at detecting those, and they're using those to develop trust around your content, and it really works. Great. Well, uh, I wanted to thank everyone for their time, and um, we'll, of course, have this recorded and up on the website tomorrow. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. See you soon.